What's up, Periscope? What's up, Facebook? What's up, everybody listening to me on the podcast? And what's up to everybody watching on YouTube? I need to move that out the way, don't I? <laughs> Prophet David Taylor here for your Thursday night teaching entitled No More Genies. Now, I've been teaching on this for over a year and a half, maybe two years. So I strongly, strongly encourage you to go back to the beginning video because I explained what No More Genies is about. But in a nutshell, No More Genies is about moving us away from our genie concept of God, where we think that both God and faith are magic, and getting us into what the Word actually says so that we can base our choices and base our prayers and base our faith on what God actually says. Because if you don't know, God is under no obligation to honor anything He didn't say. Let me say that again. God is under no obligation to honor uh, something He he didn't say. And so you can't go to the Lord with, uh, with biblical ignorance. You can't go to the Lord without any knowledge of his word and try to claim his promises and try to speak his promises in life and try to fight the enemy. You can't do any of that without knowing what the scriptures actually say. Okay? And so many people have gone to the extreme or don't know that the word of God is balanced or they don't ask the Holy Spirit which principle to apply when because they don't understand the Lord as a person, not a set of rules. So instead of walking in faith, many times people are walking in dogma. And one of the most common examples is people that say that God has to heal a certain way. Because the scripture does say that by his stripes we were healed, that Jesus already paid the cross, paid the price on the cross for our sickness and our infirmities. He already bore them, he already carried them. But there are many different ways, even in the scripture. Uh, Paul tells uh, Timothy to drink a little wine because he's having stomach problems. Uh, sometimes people got anointed with oil. Uh, one time when Jesus healed a blind man, he made some uh, clay out of spit and dirt. Sometimes the Lord just spoke a word. When Peter and John grabbed the man at the temple gate called Beautiful, pe Peter spoke the word, but then Peter grabbed him and pulled him up. <coughs> Oh, there are plenty of cases in the Old Testament where people ate some medicine or they ate some plant roots or they had some homemade things to get healed. And there are plenty of cases in the Old Testament where the Lord told them what animals to avoid because some animals were unclean and were not to be eaten. And you know that they say that the coronavirus comes from somebody who ate a bat. So the point I'm trying to make is that Unfortunately, there is far too much genie concept out there in the body of Christ, but also in the world, also unbelievers, people that don't know God and people that do know God, have far too much genie concept. They think it's magic, and then they learn one scripture, and they don't learn any kind of balance, or they don't understand that God's a person, and then it turns into dogma. And then that dogma sometimes ends up causing great harm, or in some cases, people can even lose their lives. I personally know of people that have lost their children because they didn't even bother to pray and ask God to heal or, you know, they just extreme stuff. Some people believe in no medicine at all. Some people believe in just medicine and no prayer at all. And people just go to these extremes and I'm like, well, if we understood what the word really said and if we knew how to seek the Lord for an answer. So that's what No More Genies is about. Again, I'm just encapsulating it because I go into detail in the very first video in this series. This is video number 21. This is No More Genies teaching video live broadcast podcast number 21 on No More Genies. So again, I strongly encourage you to go back to the first one and, and listen to me talk about what No More Genies is about in detail, but that's the, sum, <clears throat> the summation, that we don't have any business trying to pray something back to God that he didn't say, because <laughs> God's not going to honor any promise he didn't make. So you need to know what the word actually says and stop thinking that it's magic, that faith is magic or that God is some kind of genius, that you can just live any kind of way you want to and then just pull out a Bible promise, and that's going to erase all your choices or your consequences, and none of that is true, okay? So what I've been teaching about recently is I've been teaching about the kingdom of heaven, 
because I'm a firm believer that we preach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we do not preach the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. <laughs> what we preach is born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That is not what the Lord preached. The Lord preached the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like unto, <clears throat> excuse me, the kingdom of God is like unto, the kingdom of God is like unto, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. That's actually what Jesus himself preached. He did not preach what we preach, and he did not preach what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. He preached the kingdom. And so I'm a firm believer that if we preached actually what Jesus preached, it would change a lot of things. Because I have a new motto, and my new motto is, if it's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. <laughs> if it was good enough for the Lord to spend his three years of ministry preaching and teaching on the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, then why don't we do that? And so anyway, so as I, ha as I have been studying and experiencing the parables of Jesus as he taught on the kingdom, I've discovered many new truths. And there are a lot of answers to the problems that we face actually in the parables about the kingdom of heaven. But again, they don't always have the preeminence or the prominence in some of our religious settings. And we're busy preaching and teaching everything except what Jesus preached and taught, which doesn't make any sense. So tonight, <clears throat> we're going to look at the parable of the, the man that was a householder that's hiring people to work in his vineyard. Now, I actually need to read out of both the King James and the New King James because I like both. Uh, so let me just pull that up and lay them side by side. But uh, yeah, so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So let's uh, have a word of prayer and then we're going to jump on in. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time, Lord. I ask you to fill me with the Holy Ghost, O God. Wash me and cleanse me by your blood. Breathe in me, breathe through me, speak through my mouth, my hand gestures. Lord, Lord everything I surrender to you so that your word may go forth, that you might be glorified, that the body of Christ might hear what you want uh, heard on this night. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. All right, so we're going to read out of Matthew 20. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. Matthew, as you may or may not know, was a tax collector. And he was a tax collector for the Roman government, but he was doing so against his own people. So many times what the tax collectors would do is they would add extra percentages onto the tax. So if the Roman government required 15%, the tax collectors would you know, collect 20%. From the people in pocket the extra five. So they were not anybody's favorite. Nobody liked the tax collectors. Nobody probably liked Matthew. It's really funny that the Lord would pick a man like that to be a part of his 12. But that's who wrote this book. Somebody who worked for the Internal Revenue Service of the Roman government who had the, uh, had the Jews in captivity, uh, who the Jews were in captivity to during the time of Christ. They were not in charge of Israel. They were not in charge of Jerusalem. The Roman Empire was when the Lord walked the earth. Okay? And one of the reasons that the 12 men that followed Jesus, one of the reasons, the main reasons they all followed him, is because they thought he was going to overthrow the Roman government and reestablish Israel uh, uh, you know, as the rulers of the land, and they were going to take over Jerusalem, and Jerusalem would be under Israeli control again. That's what they thought Jesus was going to do. Okay, so that's why those 12 men initially, that's why most of them followed him. They were expecting a revolution. Okay, just a little background. Okay, so we're going to start on Matthew chapter 20. We're going to read verse 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 16. These verses and this parable is action-packed. Just fair warning. Okay. Uh, King James ver Version first. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. 
And when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, now in the New King James it says a denarius a day. A denarius was pretty much a day's labor for hired labor back in that day. So it's not a copper penny like we think of it worth one cent. Okay, that's the King James Version. But in the New King James, it says a denarius, okay, which was worth a little bit more, but it was considered a day's rate wages for hired labor during this time, okay? And when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them, so it was basically standard pay for a day's work. He sent them into his vineyard. He went out about the third hour and saw others standing out on the marketplace. And he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, I will give you. And they went their way. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. <clears throat> and so when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny, or a denarius, a day's wages, even though they'd only worked one hour. Uh, but when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he, Jesus, answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is and go thy way, and I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Is thine eye evil, because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Wow. Okay, I could spend a week on this passage, uh, but we've got to move forward. Okay, so the Lord said that this is what his kingdom is like. And remember, I told you in an earlier vi vi uh, video why Matthew uses the kingdom of heaven and all the other three books use the kingdom of God. There's a specific reason for that. Okay, watch the earlier videos. So he went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. So that's God calling people to work into his kingdom, okay? He agreed with those people that he called very, very early uh, for that denarius for a day's wages, okay? Then he went out about the third hour, okay? Hired some more people. Went out the sixth and the ninth hour, okay? Uh, went out the eleventh hour. That's one hour before quitting time, by the way. <clears throat> and found others standing idle. And the Lord said, why are you standing here idle? And they said, because nobody hired us. And the Lord said, go into my vineyard, whatever is right, you, you shall receive it. So when the evening was come, the Lord said to the laborers, give them the hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And so when the people that came in at the last minute, the last hour before quitting time, when it's time for them to get paid, they received the same pay. They received a denarius. They received a day's wages, even though they would only worked an hour. And the people that Jesus called at the very first, early in the morning, the very first people, the people that had been working in his vineyard all day, they received the same pay, the same pay as the, the people that had worked starting at the 11th or the last hour. Now, you know, people disagree on what the metaphor is here, what the Lord is comparing and some people have different ideas about what the Lord's trying to illustrate. So some people say that <clears throat> this is the difference between people that, excuse me, get saved very early in life. And some people that get saved very late in life because both get eternal life. Now there's a case to be made for that being true because we can see that in the thief on the cross. If you're not familiar with the story of the thief on the cross, when Jesus was dying, stretched out on the cross, because remember the Lord was on the cross for six hours. When Jesus was dying, there were two thieves, one on his left hand, one on his right hand. One of the thieves made fun of him and said, you are no king because you're in the same boat we're in. But the other thief, other thief said, Lord, remember me 
when you come into your kingdom. So in other words, he looked at Jesus and believed he was the Lord, believed he was the Son of God. And the Lord said to him, famously, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. So the thief on the cross that looked, in Jesus, looked at Jesus and believed literally got saved in the last moments of his life. He was a thief and he, he got caught. He was being punished for his crimes. He was dying next to Jesus. He looked at Jesus and believed and got ticketed to paradise. He got born again in that moment. And that thief has eternal life, just like somebody that got saved at five years old and served God their whole life and died at 95. And if you serve God for 90 years and the thief on the cross looked in the last minutes of his life and believed in Jesus, he got eternal life just like you got eternal life. So there's a case to be made for that interpretation. Because it's true. Um, and when you look at the attitude of the people that started working early, sometimes you see that attitude in people that have been saved a while. Sometimes if God raises up somebody, maybe later in life, or maybe it looks like they come out of nowhere, or maybe God has been hiding them for a while, and then all of a sudden he reveals them, and maybe the Lord gives them great favor or great opportunity or something like that. If that's the case, then sometimes there's a tendency for people that have been in the game for a while, that have been working for God for a while, to get angry or to get jealous or to get envious or to get resentful. It's one of the very easiest things to do. Because people that have been walking with God for a while kind of feel like, you know, they paid their dues or whatever and, you know, whatever. So when you look at that reaction, that's a totally human reaction. That's a totally normal reaction. If, people, if you've been in the game for a while and God raises up somebody after you that started working one hour before quitting time and you've been serving God all day, you've been serving God all your life, and then the Lord turns around and gives them the same thing that he gives you. Let me say that one more time. Then the Lord turns around and gives them the same thing, okay, that he gives you. So what would you do? What would you do if you've been preaching 20 years and you've always wanted to be a pastor? Okay, and after 20 years worth of preaching, you finally get your own church. And somebody that started preaching a month ago, and after a month of preaching, they have their own church. What would you do? What would you do if you were confronted with that kind of situation? Okay, so it's the easiest thing in the world for people to get the idea that if you've been serving God for a while, that you deserve more or he can't use other people or other people coming in at the last minute aren't legitimate or they're not as legitimate as you or they're not as saved as you or whatever. That's a very common thing that happens. So there's an argument to be made for that um, particular interpretation. Okay. And so if that is indeed the case, then that's something we would have to guard against as believers. If we think that because he uh, blesses people that haven't been serving him as long as we have, that somehow that's wrong, or somehow the Lord can't do that, or somehow... We get to decide, okay? We get to decide who God chooses, who God uses, and how he rewards. Because remember, during the story, the Lord is hiring people all day long. He didn't just hire the first workers, and he did just hire the last workers. He hired uh, people all day long, okay? So remember that the third hour is about 9 o'clock. Sixth hour is noon. Eleventh hour is five o'clock in the evening. Okay? So quitting time was around six. So that's why the Bible says, gather them together when the evening was come. Okay? So the Lord said that whatever is right, I'm going to give you. So what I find the most interesting, however, out of all this is the Lord's response so whatever you think, analog whatever analogy that the Lord is using, whether it's age or getting saved or serving God for a certain length of time, whatever you think the analogy is, what I find very, very interesting and what I think the point is, 
is the Lord's response. So I want to examine that in detail. So let's look at verse number 13. But he, Jesus, answered one of them, and them is talking about the workers that started working early in the day, that got angry that the people that started working one hour before quitting time got the same money that they did. So he, Jesus, answered one of those early workers and said unto them, Friend, I did thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny or a denarius? What does that mean using the eternal life analogy? It means that God's agreement with us is that if we look upon Jesus, if we ABC, if we admit that we are sinners, if we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died on the cross for our sins and rose again the third day, and if we confess with our mouths what we believe in our hearts, the Bible says that thou shalt be saved. The Bible does not say you got to hurry up and do that when you're still a kid. You should get saved as early as, as possible, but what if you don't? So the Lord says, I have done you no wrong. Okay? So in other words, if you get saved as a child and you get eternal life, you got eternal life because you ABC'd, because you admitted you were a sinner, you believed on Jesus, you confessed it with your mouth while you believed him with your heart. You did not get saved because you were young. If you get saved in the last years of your life, the last months of your life, the last minutes of your life, let's say you're 95, 98, 99, 102 years old, and you ABC on your deathbed, you admit that you were a sinner, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died on the cross, rose again the third day, and you confess that with your mouth as you're believing it in your heart, then you're going to be saved too. You have just as much of a right to God's kingdom and to the reward of eternal life as that person that got saved when they were five. And so what I believe this is a picture of, of what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like when there are a lot of saints that get to glory and start asking the Lord, what is so-and-so doing here? What is that person doing here? How in the world are they here? I know that person. They did not live a Christian life. I stopped by to tell you, if they got saved on their deathbed, they have just as much right to eternal life as those that got saved as a child. Do you know why? Because our salvation is not based on what we do. Our salvation is not based on the age we are when we accept Jesus. Our salvation is based on the finished work of Christ on the cross and us believing and receiving that into our lives at whatever point we do. Okay? So now I'm talking about entrance into the kingdom. I'm talking about eternal life. Rewards is something different, maybe, but according to this parable, you know, we don't know what God's going to do with that. God will always reward you based on what is right, because that's what he said, I'll give you what is right. But my point here is that if this is talking about salvation, then if you got saved when you were five, or you got saved when you were 95, you both have the same eternal life, because it's based on Jesus, not when you accepted it. It's not based on your age. It's based on the finished work of Christ on the cross. And so I think that there are definitely going to be some, what I call senior saints or veteran saints. I don't mean older people. I mean people that have been walking with God for a while. When they see some of the people that make it in, some of the people might make it in by the hair of their chinny chin chin, might have been five minutes before they died. But if they looked on Jesus and they believed they ABC'd, then they got born again. They get eternal life just like you do. Okay? So the Lord said he doesn't do people any wrong. And he doesn't. If he gives eternal life to people that get it at 90, and if he gives eternal life to people that get it at 10, who has he done wrong? How has he wronged you? Because the deal was not how long you work for me. The deal was look upon Jesus and ABC, admit your sinner, believe in the Christ, confess with your mouth. That was the deal, okay? Now, I also want to mention here, what if the plan and purpose and destiny of God for your life has to do with you being physically older? I will give you two examples, one that seemed to be the will of God and another one that seemed to be the permissive will of God or something that God allowed to happen. First example I want to give you is, of course, Abraham. Abraham started out named Abram with his wife Sarai, his wife Sarai. God later on changed her name from Abram to Abraham. God added the Hebrew breath mark, which means that God breathed life into Abram 
turned him, him into Abraham. And Sarai, he turned it to Sarah, the Hebrew breath mark, because he breathed life into her. That couple was specifically called by God to begin the Hebrew nation. Uh, that man was promised by God that his children would be like the sands on the beach and the stars in the sky. But God did not actually give that couple a baby until Abraham was 100 years old. So he got called away from his family, away from the earth, the Chaldees, the Chaldeans, and away from his kinfolk at the age of 75. Isaac was not born until Abraham was 100. And the Bible says clearly in Romans 4 that Abraham's body was now dead. So in other words, Abraham couldn't perform sexually anymore. He was 100 years old and his body didn't work sexually anymore. God waited until Abraham's body was dead, until Sarah's womb was dead. And then God gave them Isaac because God wanted to show that he was the one that gave them the baby, that God in heaven was the God of fertility that Isaac was a child of promise, that Isaac was born of the spirit and not because of any natural effort uh, from Abraham and Sarah. Okay, God wanted all the glory. God wanted the birth of Isaac to point back to him. So what would you do if God's call on your life doesn't kick in until you're 75 years old? There would be some people who've been serving God since they were very, very young who would be telling you that God couldn't use you because you're too old. Who would be telling you, you didn't have no business getting married and having children. You didn't have no business doing none of what you were doing at that age and stage of life. There would be people that would make a point to come tell you that you were a crazy person. And that is how God chose to start the Jewish nation with an older couple who had a miracle baby in severe old age. So my point in bringing that up is that's how our faith started. Abraham is the father of faith. He's the father of the faithful. Abraham is the father of Christians, of Palestinians, and Hebrews. So Jewish people, Palestinians or Arabs, and believers as Christians. Uh, oh, Holly Stark, why doesn't God stop the virus? That's not a short answer. Uh, there's, it's very complicated, and it has to do with judgment. I'll have to explain that some other time. Um, so somebody just asked me about the coronavirus and that's really complicated. Okay. Like that's, that's not a five minute answer for me to answer that. Okay. So, so, uh, so Abraham again is the father of Hebrews, Palestinians or Arabs and Jews. Uh, Arabs, the father of the Palestinians is Ishmael, which is a son that he fathered when he was still sexually active. He fathered with Sarah's handmaiden, and her name was Hagar. There's a lot of debate as to Hagar, who she really was. Some said she was an African princess. Some said that Hagar was royalty. Some said that Hagar was a slave. Some said that Hagar was a handmaiden and attended to Sarah. There's a lot of debate over Hagar as well. But the point was, when Abraham was still sexually active, by the strength of his own body, he slept with Hagar, and she got pregnant, and she had Ishmael. And Ishmael is the biological father of the Palestinians or the Arab people. Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are the patriarchs of the Jewish or the Hebrew people. And then Christians, those that believe on Jesus Christ, are the spiritual children of Abraham because we had faith just like Abraham. And just like God counted uh, the rewards of Abraham through faith, God counts our faith unto righteousness and rewards us with justification, eternal life, and all the things that come with believing on Jesus. So Abraham is a father of Jews, Palestinians, and Christians, okay? But that whole destiny that was given to him by God didn't even start till that man was 75 years old and God let he and Sarah's bodies die sexually. Then he gave them Isaac. So what would you do if that was your call from God? What would you do if God called you to have a miracle baby late in life because everybody and their mama going to tell you that you ain't got no business having kids that late in life and that's selfish and you're not going to live long enough to see them grow up and how is your body going to take the strain and you can't run around with it and yeah 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 and people go run their mouth and tell you that you ain't got no business doing that but what if that's what God called you to do because remember that's how God started this thing God started our faith with a miracle baby from a super old couple did you miss that in the Bible so my point being there is that Jesus said, friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny. What I mean there is that whatever your destiny is with God, 
That's between you and God. And if you think you get to tell somebody that maybe their destiny wasn't supposed to kick in until later in life. I'm going to give you another example. I don't think this was the perfect will of God, but this was, you know, the permissive will of God, and that would be Moses. I think, well, I know for sure that Moses knew he was the deliverer, because at 40 years of age, Moses saw a fellow Hebrew being persecuted, and Moses had been raised to be a prince of Egypt, but Moses could not stand to see that Hebrew slave being beaten by the Egyptians, so Moses tried to deliver the Hebrew, and Moses ended up killing the Egyptian. But Moses committed murder, and he realized he messed up, and he ran. And so Moses ran all the way to the backside of the desert, and he established himself in Midian. Moses took a wife, had some kids, and became a shepherd. And Moses spent 40 years in Midian, from the ages of 40 to 80. Moses was in Midian, and I'm sure Moses was thinking, I've had a good life, i got a good thing going, got a wife going, got a family going, I'm tending sheep, I'm not worried about that deliverance stuff, I'm good. I'm sure Moses was thinking, I'm 80 years old, I'm good. And then here God comes calling Moses out the burning bush, telling Moses to go down there and stick his finger in Pharaoh's face and tell him to let my people go at the age of 80. Everything that Moses did that he's famous for besides killing the Egyptian, he did between the ages of 80 and 120. Now, President Jimmy Carter, I believe, just turned 94. Let me look that up to be sure. President Jimmy Carter is in his mid-90s, and he is 95, okay? Uh, so President Jimmy Carter is 95 years old. That's the same age range that Moses was in when he did everything he's famous for, because Moses was in the age range of 80 to 120 when he stuck his finger in Pharaoh's face, when he brought the 10 plagues of Egypt, when he brought the Exodus, when he spoiled the Egyptians and took all their gold and their jewels, when they left, when he uh, called water out of the rock, when he called quails on the beach, when manna fell from heaven, when he held up his rod and parted the Red Sea. All the stuff that Moses is famous for, he did between the ages of 80 and 120. And President Jimmy Carter is 95 years old right now. So that's the age range Moses was in. Okay, so that being the case, I think if Moses had been listening to God and doing what the Lord wanted him to do, he could have kicked out all that off between 40 and 80. But, you know, maybe he missed it. Maybe he wasn't ready. He wasn't operating in faith, obviously, because he tried to deliver them by his own hand. When Moses came back the second time at the age of 80, he was intent on bringing deliverance by God's hand, not his own hand. Moses went down there to fight with his own hand and, and fist fight. Moses was down there to point his finger and said that I am that I am, said let my people go. And Moses had God's power in his rod, remember, because that rod could turn into a snake. See, So he was equipped with God's power when he went back, but it was 80, 80 to 120 when he wrote all the law, all the books that he wrote all the Levitical laws and, and Deuteronomy and everything that Moses wrote, that was between 80 and 120, climbing that mountain to spend time with, face time with God. So the point I'm trying to make is, what if you miss it? What if you miss what God wanted you to do at a certain age and stage of life, but God decides not to throw you out? Because remember, God could always take your destiny and take your kingdom and give it to somebody else because God don't need you. God does not ever need you. Whenever God is offering something to you, he's giving you a chance to work for him and work in his kingdom. But God, at no point does God need you. So God can take your destiny, take your kingdom and give it to somebody else because he does not need you. But God had mercy on Moses and God did not take Moses' destiny, but rather he kept Moses' destiny in store. And when Moses turned 80, he came back to him with it again. So what if you miss it at a certain age or stage of life and God doesn't throw you out and then way later in life, God comes to you again and gives you another chance? If God comes to you later in life and gives you another chance, I guarantee you there are going to be people who tell you, what are you doing doing that at your age? What are you doing trying to serve God now? You had a chance 40 years ago to kick your ministry off. Why didn't you do it then? 
and they're going to disqualify you, and they're going to say that you ain't got no business doing what you're doing. But what if God gives you another chance in your later years? What if you did miss it when you were young? What if you should have been further along? What if things were set up for you to get started much earlier, and you missed it? But God, in his mercy, decided to give you another chance in your later years. You can't go back. You can't go back in time and be young again. So what are you supposed to do? So Moses took advantage of his second chance after him and God wrestled with it for a while. Moses didn't jump on it right away. But he eventually said yes to the Lord and became the, the person, the Old Testament apostle, the Old Testament prophet that we know. Okay? That's eventually who Moses became because he accepted his call from God except he accepted it at 80 instead of accepting it at 40 like he could have. So what are you going to do if that happens to you? What if God gives you a chance when you're young and you just miss it? So God gives you another chance later on. Are you going to turn? Are you going to slap God's hand away? Are you going to turn down your destiny because people think you're too old? Are you going to tell God no? What if God offers you a chance for greatness? What if God offers you a chance to use your life to bless nations of people? To bless people that haven't even been born yet because of the things that he wants to do in your life. What if God gives you a chance like that? Are you going to tell him no? Because now you're older? Because you know people are going to talk about you like a dog? you trying to do all that, all that stuff and you're already older? You're already up in years? You see my point? So Jesus said to these people that have been working for him all day, he did not actually do them any wrong because he gave them what they agreed upon. And if, like Abraham, your destiny doesn't really start until you're 75, that's the agreement, that's the covenant he made with God. He, God told Abraham, if you, God told Abram, if you believe me, fear me, walk uprightly before me, follow me, I'll make you a father of many nations. That was the deal offered to him at 75. Okay? And God told Moses to go down there and get in Pharaoh's face at 80. See? So if you've been working for God since you were a child and God takes someone that's already a senior citizen or already an elder and God uses their life mightily, he can give them the same thing he gave you if he wants to. So the Lord said, friend, I do you no wrong. Matthew 20, 13. This not, this now didst not thou agree with me for a denarius. Take that thine ears and go thy way. Oh, the Lord said, take your money and mind your business. That's not the first time Jesus said that. He said that to one of his best friends. He said that to Peter. Peter was asking Jesus. Peter was walking behind Jesus and the apostle John. And Peter asked Jesus, what about this man? What, what's John going to do? And Peter looked at Jesus, uh, Jesus looked at Peter and said, what's that to you? You follow me. So in other words, Jesus told Peter, ain't none of your business. What I'm doing with John ain't none of your business. You follow me. You do what I told you to do. Jesus says, take what's yours and go thy way. Jesus said, take your money and get your hat. Okay, so the Lord is telling us in no uncertain terms that when God gives you a reward, take your reward, say thank you, Jesus, and bounce. Don't be standing around complaining about what he's doing with other people. See, to me, that is just such a clear picture of what I believe is going to happen when we all get to the glory realm. I believe there are going to be tons of believers that are standing around watching Jesus deal with people. And they're going to walk up to Jesus and say, that person has no right to be here because I know they didn't live to save life or they weren't saved enough for you. And the Lord's going to look right at you. And I believe he's going to say what he said here. He said, is your, you know, what's that got to do with you? Didn't I give you what we agreed upon? And the Lord said, take that in and go that way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. So the Lord said, I am going to reward them. I am going to pay them, the people that started working at the last hour. The same way I paid those that started working earliest in the morning. Wow, the Lord said this is what his kingdom is like. So we already know his kingdom is not like the kingdom of man. We already know that the kingdom of heaven is not like the kingdom of man. Because if you started working early in the morning and somebody started working right before quitting time, got the same money as you, you'd scream bloody murder, you sue, you beat, bust somebody upside the head, you would never shut up about it. 20 years later, you'd be talking about, I can't believe they got the same money as me. But the Lord said that we have to take what's ours and go our way because he's going to give what he wants to whom he wants. Then it says, is it not lawful? Verse 15, Matthew 20, 15. Jesus says, is it not lawful? Is it not lawful 
for me to do what I will with mine own. So the Lord says, I'm breaking no law. The Lord says, I am not illegal here. The Lord said, I am not outside of any law. Because he says, I can do what I want with mine own. Now, you hear me say it all the time, but I think it bears repeating here. Uh, I think that if you walk with God long enough, I think religious people and veteran Christians start to get the idea that they own God and that they own the kingdom and that people have to qualify based on what they think. They have to be saved enough for you. And if they're not saved enough to, for you, then people decide a whole bunch of things. But the Lord said, this is my kingdom. Now, you hear me say it all the time, but if Jesus ever reached out his hand to you, you will see the nail print in his hand. So what that means in no uncertain terms is that the Lord paid the cost to be the king of kings. The Lord wears a crown called the royal diadem. That word diadem means the crown of crowns. That's why he's called the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We're the kings the Bible is talking about. We're the lords that the Bible is talking about. But Jesus has the crown of crowns, the royal diadem. So he's above us. He has the name. Blessings to you, 2020 Love Gives. He has the name that's above every name. He has the throne that's above every throne. Okay? So Jesus is the king of kings and the lord of lords. Okay? Seated right to the, uh, sitting uh, right on the right hand of the Father. So the Lord said, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? So in other words, the Lord is saying it is perfectly legal for me to take what's in my kingdom and do with what I want with it. So that means if you challenge the Lord on what he does and what he chooses to bless, all the Lord has to do is hold up his hand and let you see the nail print. And the Lord said, well, I paid the cost to be the boss up in here. That's not an exaggeration. That's a literal truth. He did pay the cost. Did you die on the cross for the sins of the world? Did you die on the cross and shed your blood? so that men and women, boys and girls might be saved, so their sins might be remitted before Father God? Did you die on the cross to have people's names written in the Lamb Book of Life? Did you do that? I'm just asking a question. Did you do that? No, you didn't do that because you're not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. And the Lord says right here that it's lawful for him to take what is his and do what he wants with it. So that means if God is using somebody we don't like, if they are being led by the Lord, that ain't for us to get in. Just like, okay, I'll give you a Bible example. Like King David. When King David sinned, he sinned big time against the Lord. King David had an affair with another man's wife. He got her pregnant. He brought that man in. That man's name was Uriah. He was a soldier. He brought that man off, brought that man off the battlefield, got him lit, and told him to go sleep with his wife because he was trying to pass the baby off as Uriah. So Uriah said, even drunk, I'm not going to go have sex with my wife because my brother and all on the battlefield fighting, and it's not right for me to be at home having pleasure while my fellow soldiers are out there fighting in the battlefield. So Uriah wouldn't sleep with his wife, Bathsheba. So then David sent Uriah back out into the field, told the, the soldiers around him, because David was a master military strategist. So David did something very, very wrong. He told, when they would assault a castle, like in the movie 300, if you ever seen the movie 300, they would hold their shields up in front of the soldiers so that when the arrows came down from the archers at the top of the castle, they would hit the shields. They told, King David told them that when they were in the midst of the battle, to back away so that the soldiers would get hit by those arrows and killed. And that's how King David had Uriah killed. But remember, a lot of men died that day, not just Uriah. David had a company of men killed so that it wouldn't look like he was targeting Uriah. After that man was killed, they had his funeral, and then David moved Bathsheba into the palace and married her, and then they had the baby, and they was going to keep it moving like nothing happened. <laughs> then, after they had the baby, then a God sent Nathan, and Nathan rebuked the king and told the king that his sin was heinous, and his sin was very long in the eyes of the Lord. But then Nathan said, The Lord has put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. 
Because David knew, and Nathan knew that King David deserved death for what he did. But God had mercy on him and said, I'm not going to kill you. But then God pronounced all these other judge, judgments. And one of the, those judgments is that God was going to raise out trouble from David's own house. Later on, one of David's sons, Absalom, rebelled against his father, slept with David's concubines, his girlfriends, his side women, in front of all Israel, and tried to kick his father off the, off the throne, and David had to run for his life. Even after all that, King David eventually got his throne back. And he got his throne back because God had declared it so. Even in the midst of all that trouble and judgment and consequences, God gave that man his throne back. I stop by to tell you, <laughs> if there are any King Davids in our midst and God gives you your throne back, that is none of our business. If God says you're over like he did with King Saul, then you are over. There's no coming back for you. If, if Jesus said you're over like he did with Judas Iscariot, you're over. There's no coming back for you. But if God says you are not over like he did with Peter, Peter uh, denied the Lord. He didn't betray the Lord. Judas betrayed the Lord or Peter denied the Lord. And Peter got to the point of cursing and swearing and acting like he didn't even know who Jesus was. And Jesus already told him that, that was what he was going to do before it happened. And then Jesus went and got Peter after he resurrected and reconnected and restored the fellowship and brought Peter back into the company of the apostles. Because Jesus did not say that Peter was over. But Jesus, Jesus did say that Judas was over. Jesus said about Judas, it would have been better if that man had never been born. Because he betrayed the Lord into the hands of the Roman soldiers, and there's no coming back from that. He betrayed the innocent blood of Christ, and Judas is the one that triggered the events that took Jesus to the cross. Even though that was a plan, and the Lord allowed it to happen, Judas was the betrayer that set all that in motion. So if Jesus says you're over, you're over. If Jesus does not say you're over, even if you cursed and swore and act like you weren't a Christian, if the Lord comes back and gets you and brings you back in the fold, I stop by to tell you, that's none of our business. So both with King David and Apostle Peter, those are two examples in the scripture where there were men that did very wrong things, very unchristian things. It's not right for a, a, a Christian king like King David or a believer in God to be sleeping with another man's wife. It's not what, right for him to get her pregnant. It's not right for him to try to cover it up. And it's not right for him to have that man killed, to have the husband killed. None of that is right. King David did all that. Peter walked and talked with Jesus in public for three years. Jesus, uh, Peter was among some of the, the first men that Jesus called. And then things got to the point where Peter was under so much pressure, he didn't want to get crucified at that point because Peter actually did end up getting crucified at the end of his life, but it was much later. Peter did not want to get arrested and killed at that point, and he began to curse like the sailor he was to try to act like he didn't know the Lord. And the Lord forgave him. And the Lord went and got him, and the Lord restored him and brought him back into the twelve. Apostle Peter, well, there's two books in the canon of Scripture, but Apostle Peter actually wrote six books. He actually wrote six books before are not included. But the first one and the last one, first and second Peter, are included in the New Testament. But the point I'm trying to make is that the Lord did not say that Peter was over. And if the Lord went back and got one of his best friends and brought him back in the fold, that ain't none of our business. Okay? So the Lord said, isn't it lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much more plainly that can be stated. And then the Lord says, so on verse 15, is thine eye evil because I am good? Oh my goodness, what a thing for the Lord to say. I stop by to tell you that just because you hate people doesn't mean that Jesus does. Just because you won't forgive people, it doesn't mean that God won't forgive them. Do you want an example of that in the Bible? An example of that in the Bible is, of course, Jonah. Jonah is an Old Testament prophet. Jonah had agreed with God that God would use his life to prophesy. And Jonah had agreed to go wherever God sent him. But one day God told him to go to Nineveh. Jonah hated the Ninevites. Now, if you do background and research, once again, scholars say different things. But one of the things that some scholars say about the Ninevites is that the Ninevites had actually killed Jonah's family. 
if that's true, if that if that account of history is actually true, you can see why Jonah would have beef with the Ninevites. Because Jonah said, I don't want them to get saved. Jonah said, if I go and preach to them, I know you're going to save them because you're merciful. And I don't want mercy on them Ninevites. I want them all to die and go to hell. That's exactly what Jonah said. So Jonah ran from his call to Nineveh. And as you know, the famous story, God sent a whale to swallow him. And Jonah stayed in the belly of the whale three days until he repented and said, okay, I'll go. The whale vomited him back up. And then Jonah went and preached to the Ninevites. And sure enough, they got saved. And Jonah was still mad. After he went and preached to them people and they got saved, he was still mad because Jonah said, I knew it. I knew they was going to get saved. I knew it. I wanted you to judge them. I wanted you to burn them. I wanted you to destroy them because I hate them. And God said to Jonah, is that the right attitude to have, Jonah? Are you doing well to be angry? So what God did was God made a plant grow overnight because it was really hot. So God made a plant grow to give Jonah shade. But then the plant died in 24 hours. And then Jonah was like, oh, man, I really miss my plant. It was giving me some shade. And God said to Jonah, you had compassion over a plant that lived and died in 24 hours. Shouldn't I have compassion over a whole city of people? And then also they have much cattle, much livestock much livestock. So in other words, God said to Jonah, it's a city full of people and they have resources. Should not have mercy on them. God said to Jonah the same thing Jesus said. Is your eye evil because mine is good? God said, can't I be good to people because I want to be good to people? I stopped by to tell you again, those of you both believers and unbelievers, those of you that don't believe in God and those of you that do that are listening to me right now, just because you won't forgive people doesn't mean that God won't forgive people. I know that so many of us have people, that we have wounds in our heart from people that have hurt us severely. And you may have forgiven them, but you sure don't want to be around them. I don't want to see you no more. I stop by to tell you that just because you won't forgive people, it doesn't mean that God doesn't forgive people. Just because you want to be evil to people because you think they deserve it, maybe they do deserve it. Maybe they deserve everything you want to do to them. Maybe they do deserve it. But what if the Lord decides to be good to them? Just because you hate them, it doesn't mean that God hates them. Just because you want to destroy them, it doesn't mean that God wants to destroy them. Just because you won't have mercy, it doesn't mean that God won't have mercy. And so the Lord said, is, is our eye evil? Is your eye evil? Because I am good. What a thing for Jesus to say. If you know somebody that comes into the kingdom and you know how they live before they got saved and you see the Lord start to bless them and then you get resentful, is your eye evil? Because the Lord's eye is good. You don't get to tell the Lord who to be good to. Just because you have racism in your heart and you hate people of a certain color or skin tone doesn't mean that Jesus hates them just because you hate them. You might hate men. You might hate women. You might hate children. Just because you hate children, just because you hate women, just because you hate men, it doesn't mean that Jesus does. Okay? And the Lord challenges us here. He tells us what his kingdom is like. He says, just because you got an evil eye, just because you won't forgive, just because you don't think something should happen a certain way, just because you think you deserve something and somebody else doesn't, or vice versa, that doesn't have anything to do with the Lord's judgment because he said, I do what I want with mine. And he said, do you have an evil eye just because I'm good? Then he goes on to say, last verse we're going to deal with tonight, Matthew 20, 16, so the last shall be first. And the first last, for many be called, but few chosen. Now, people have gone round and round and round and round for years trying to understand what Jesus meant by that. So the Lord said, the last shall be first and the first last. There's many, many different ways to interpret that. So I'm not going to tell you that I have a definitive interpretation. I'll just give you one of the things I think that means. One of the things I think that means is that a lot of people that get a lot of props and a lot of accol accolades and a lot of glory for themselves in this life are last in the eyes of God because God only honors that which gives him glory. And God tells us in the scripture that if you are living 
for the praise of man. God said, you better enjoy that while you have it, because that's all you get. You get no reward from me. So I believe that people that are all about getting the accolades and the praise and the rewards of man aren't going to get any reward from God. So they might be first in this life, but they might be last in the sight of God. And the flip is also true. Some people that you will live and die in obscurity, nobody will ever call your name. Nobody will ever know who you are. But if you serve God faithfully in the way he tells you to, then you will get a full reward. You, you might be one of the first in the kingdom of heaven. That's part of what I think that means. And then the Lord says, for many be called, but few chosen. There's a lot of debate about what the Lord means by that statement. Okay? Many be called, but few chosen. So once again, I will not try to say this is a definitive interpretation. I will tell you what I think that means. When it says that many be called, but few are chosen, I believe that God opens his hand to a lot of people, but God works with whoever shows up and makes the commitment. So if God offers his kingdom to 10 people, he called 10, but only two people showed up to actually serve him, then he'll choose to work with those two that showed up. That's part of what I think that means. Because I think there are a lot of people that run from their destiny with God. I know I did. I know I fought it for a while. I know that there are a lot of people that when God calls you, he's offering you a chance to work in his kingdom. But a lot of people just slap his hand away and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And they run their whole lives. But some people say yes to God. And I believe that God chooses to work with, even though he may have called a whole bunch of people, like God called the nation of Israel, and then he called 120, and then he called 70, and then he called the 12, and then he called three, and then among the three, he called the one Apostle John to give Mary to. I believe that there's a call that goes out, but the Lord's going to work with whoever shows up to honor the call. Because the Lord says many are called, but few are chosen. Now, some people interpret that to mean that God calls a lot of people, but then there's some people that are chosen children of God, sent into the earth to do specific things that God had already decided, like Moses, like Samson, like David, like Samuel. That's possible too. That's, that's a different interpretation, but that's also possible too. That there's only some people who had, you know, so I don't know, that's what I'm saying. I'm not giving a definitive saying that this is what this means. I'm saying this is what part of what I think that means, but there are other interpretations and scholars have been going around and around about what Jesus said. But let's do a quick review because time's almost up. But the point I've been trying to make all night is that even though we think what happened wasn't fair, I stopped by to tell you there's no such thing as fair. There's no such thing as fairness. Fairness is a human concept. What we mean by something is fair is we think that all people are supposed to get all the same things all the time. And fairness in the mind of man always means it's supposed to go the way we think it should go. The Lord demonstrates in this parable that his kingdom don't go the way we think it should go. It goes the way he thinks it should go. And there is no such thing as fair. See what I mean? So this is a powerful, powerful parable. And I could teach on it for a while. And that's what I mean when I say, if we preached and talked the things that Jesus actually said, it clears up a lot of our issues it clears up a lot of our issues, and it issues a challenge that if you've been walking with God for a while and somebody just came in the kingdom, if God is choosing to use them, use them, or let's say their call, like I said, with Abraham and Moses, doesn't kick in until they're older, and maybe that doesn't look right to you. Maybe you think they don't have no business doing what they're doing at that age, but what if that was God's plan all along? See what I mean? So the Lord said that's what his kingdom is like. All right. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen. When you see me close my eyes and pray in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Spirit, are there any more prophetic words? Are there any words of healing? Any words of deliverance? And any financial words? Okay. So if you got any prayer requests, put them on the screen now. Okay, God says there's somebody uh, you're having issues with your stomach. Put your hand on the screen. Okay, in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak to that stomach. And I command that stomach to be 100% whole. The stomach lining, the cells, the bacteria, the acid, 
um, every part of your stomach I commanded to be 100% whole because by his stripes we were healed. Okay, because surely he has borne our sickness and carried our diseases or our infirmities. So in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, you are healed. And I command that stomach to be 100%. No more digestion problems, no more stomach aches, but 100% whole and clean in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. All right, God is saying to some of y'all listen to me right now, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, I wish I was there in person. Uh, it's easier to minister in person. But to be filled with the Spirit of God, you need to ask Father God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. And when you ask him to fill you with the Holy Ghost, lift your hands and begin to praise him and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Begin to glorify him. And you will feel the Spirit of God fall. It, it will manifest differently in different people. Some people will have a manifestation of tongues. Some people will cry. Some people will begin to prophesy. A lot of people pass out right on the ground. Okay? But when you ask the Lord, when you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost, all you have to do is ask Father to fill you. God bless you, Apostle. Dennis, God bless you. Um, God, you need to ask Father God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Okay? You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost every day. And there are many, many anointings. So getting filled with the Holy Ghost is not a one-time thing. Getting filled with the Holy Ghost and the anointing, they're different things. Okay? So you need to ask Father God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Okay? If you want to be filled. Because the Holy Spirit is telling me that there are some that need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost operate by the power of the Holy Ghost. So it's not this big leap for us as the creatures made in His image. And for his body to be filled and, and operate by the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's another thing that I need to do some extensive teaching on. But the Holy Spirit told me to say that. That some of you looking at me need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You've been wondering what it is that's missing in your life. You need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? And you also need deliverance. You need any kind of unclean spirit broken off of you. Any kind of curse. Anything that you've been involved in that's satanic. Or anything that you inherited from your bloodline. Anything. That maybe your father, your grandfather did. You need broken off your bloodline so you can be completely free. Okay? And that comes from the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Ghost, which is why you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Okay, I think that's it. Amen. God bless you. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me tonight on Second Thursday Night for No More Genies. And our subject tonight was the parable of the kingdom of heaven in terms of hiring workers. And we talked out of Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. And so I encourage you to go back to the beginning of the video and watch it from the top or listen to the podcast from the beginning or, or watch, you know, the YouTube video so you can get all of the teaching. Remember that my prophetic devotional is available on my website, prophetdavidtaylor.org, and that the next one is about to come out. So January, February, and March. March is going to be up in uh, two more weeks or so. So the next one's going to come out April, May, and June. So when I get that together, I'm so excited about it. Uh, I will let you know about that because that's going to be dropping soon. And um, so, yeah, just want to thank you for that. Got a lot more stuff coming up as well. A lot more exciting things I can't tell you about yet, but I can tell you about those too. Don't forget to check out my music on my YouTube channel, Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, PDTSOTC. I just dropped a rap track. I have a gospel workout section where if you want music to work out to, but you don't want to listen to secular music, I have gospel music you can work out to on your treadmill or put your earbuds in and go for a run, and it'll be talking about Jesus um, to a workout beat. Uh, uh, I have uh, hymns. So I have a lot of music on my channel. So that's Prophet David Taylor and Shades of the Cross on YouTube. You can look that up. Okay, so thank you so much. Oh, if you want to support my ministry financially, my Zelle is prophetdavidtaylor at gmail.com. You can support me that way. Or you can contribute to my Patreon, patreon.com slash shades of the cross. That's the name of my music ministry, Shades of the Cross. Okay, thank you so much. God bless you. I really appreciate you. I really appreciate your support, your prayers. Remember to like and share this video because whenever God releases a prophetic word or teaching, we want that to go around the world. We want as many people as possible to be exposed to it. Okay? Amen. And God bless you. I will see you this Sunday, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time for my weekly live prophetic word. And next month, 
for my second Thursday night teaching of No More Genies. Amen and God bless.